term yesterday's discussion so now we arrived yesterday we arrived to this Hamiltonian where of course we neglect many terms but this Hamiltonian is definitely has the largest matrix element I just repeating myself uh, uh, matrix uh, largest matrix element in the corner of the Hilbert space we want to study ground state and low excited state and so so now we have to diagonalize it uh, and diagonalization of course uh, it, it has this this we, we, we know what it is it's just particles numbers so it's a nice term but these two terms are kind of anomalous and uh, what Bogolyubov did and proposed so we somehow has to diagonalize this form or what what it means to present it and this is our goal to present it in a form of some constant is zero well that is this one at least but you will see it will be something else plus sum over all momenta from zero non-zero and then some uh, uh, um, well the quantity what we'll call energies and some new operators which we'll call quasi particles operator Bogolyubov quasi particles or phonons operator or whatever how you call them yeah and this would has a meaning of the uh, excitation energy so quasi particles energy so you see you represent this Hamiltonian which is still complicated yeah with some unusual I would say unusual quadratic Hamiltonian are always yeah unusual in this form which is usual energies times numbers so it's just a simple bookkeeping yeah? and these are excitations so that means we also have to find a new ground state defined that it is does not have excitations this is the definition of the ground state no. So this is our goal. No. So we have to diagonalize this form, and if there would not be operators, you immediately know from a linear algebra this form can be diagonalized by linear transformation. No. So if A would be a complex number, then it's all easy. Yeah. So now Bogolyubov said, okay, let's, <coughs> let's do similar things here with the operators, but of course having in mind it's not a mathematical exercise. We have some physics behind it, this physics we have to keep and this will impose also some constraints so uh, uh, and he suggests to do it with what is called now Bogolyubov transformations so it's just a, a transformation from one set of operators to another set so he just said let me introduce the new operator new quasi particles operator which is just a linear combination of my previous one but because I have a dagger a and a dagger a dagger a a terms, that must be a linear combination of, let's say, alpha p, a linear combination of a p with some coefficient u p and v p, some coefficient v p times a dagger minus p. Why minus p? Because in the end we have a translation invariant system, so our excitations can be classified so determined to be in an uh, uh, eigen states of momentum yeah? operator. So we want to have some excitation, so that means destruction or annihilation operator for the excitations when you take the momentum P out of your system. Yeah? And take momentum P out of your system you can make in two ways and it's exactly written here. Either you take an atom or particle with momentum P out or you add a particle with momentum minus P. Yeah? So that's why here, in both cases, the momentum of the entire system will reduce by P. So either removing particle with P or adding a particle with minus P. Yeah? So the conjugate operators, of course, dagger is UPAP dagger plus VP uh, uh, A minus P. Hmm? Where I already uh, made a simplifying assumption that and it's actually uh, works for our case that as you see here I took UP and VP being real in principle you can have a complex yeah but I know this will work for sure uh, so yeah and and depend only on P that means modulus P not the direction but modulus we can consider of course a more general form 
then you have some more constraint to solve but of course you will have more freedom more ability to find out a more state like with the total momentum which is kind of superfluid would be superfluid set etc but for our purpose finding ground state and excitations this would be enough yeah but this is just a formal transformation u v are still unknown variables what do we have to impose on these u's and v's first condition we have to impose that operators alpha p and alpha so these the new operators are actually bosonic operators yeah so these are bosonic not just operators but they should satisfy bosonic commutation relation yeah there is no reason to, to for fermions to appear here so it's a bosonic choice and of course we want that this has the meaning again of creation annihilation operator that's why we need here this commutation bosonic commutation algebra to impose and of course all the others commutators should be zero Yeah. Then we know that alphas are real, so really creation and relation operators, and then these things here really has the meaning of the number of these quasi-particles with momentum p. So we have back to our initial picture, but not with atoms now, but with quasi-particles. Yeah. So that's the idea. And the second, of course, that the Hamiltonian has this form. So in the new operators, no alpha dagger alpha dagger terms appears as well as no alpha alpha terms appears like what we have here. No. So let's see what are the constraints imposed by this one. Let's check the most important one. Yeah, uh, this one. So it's constraints on UP VP. No. These are sort of Bogolubov amplitudes, has the name, but I guess most of you know these definitions. Yeah, let's check this commutation relation. Yeah, it's just straightforward. You plug in this expression, you do calculation. So let me check this one: alpha p, alpha p prime dagger. I, it is just a commutator between u p a p plus v p a minus p dagger with um, no bracket I don't need here bracket so a comma with u p pr u p prime a p prime dagger plus v p nah, prime a minus p prime now that's the commutator I have to calculate and of course I have in principle four terms but two of them are zero where we have a commuting with a and a dagger commuting with a dagger. So the only non-trivial is this one and this one. That's the only non-trivial commutator. If we just continue, the first one will be UP, UP prime, and then the commutator AP with AP prime dagger. And the second term would be plus VP, VP prime, but now commutator A minus P dagger with a minus p prime and of course these commutators are proportional to delta p p prime yeah because they non-trivially commute only when belongs to the same mode but this is a so to say canonical order of the operators so this is delta p p prime and this is other way around yeah that's why it's minus delta p p prime course minus p minus p prime but minus is the sense in relevant yeah? so if I now continue here p equals p prime so uh, let me write this delta function uh, Kronecker delta first and then in the brackets would be simply u p squared minus v p squared and this has to be simply delta p p prime yeah what we want so therefore that means this has to be one so we get the first condition 
on these operators, let me call it condition A, yeah, that u p squared minus v p squared is 1. <laughs> this is kind of non-compact things because of a minus. Yeah, um, next, we have to check this one, 2, yet. But with my choice of u's and v's, that would be automatically 0. If you put complex and uh, direction-dependent amplitudes, then you will get some extra conditions on these amplitudes. Yeah, but in my case, these two automatically satisfied. For this choice, these two conditions are automatically satisfied. Again, for the more general choice of u and v, like complex and and or, depending on the direction of momenta, yeah, this impose some extra conditions, but in our case, not. Yeah. Okay. Because we want that this operator <coughs> satisfy the bosonic commutation relation here. Mm -hmm. So this is one condition, uh, and, and, that's, and that's this algebra impose in for this choice no more. Yeah. So this is just, so still, we still have some, a lot of freedom here. And this freedom, of course, we will use just to fulfill the criteria number two. Yeah? Would be bad if there is no freedom uh, anymore. So we just have to hope on luck, then we plug in, and then these terms disappear. No, we still have freedom to do. But of course, so now the strategy is to express a in terms of alpha, yeah, because I defined alpha in terms of a, but in order to substitute it here, I have to express a in terms of alpha, put it in this Hamiltonian, do a little bit of le lengthy algebra to see how this Hamiltonian looked in this new basis, and then find the term in front of alpha dagger alpha dagger and set it to zero. The term in front of alpha alpha would be just a, a the same, yeah, because of the hermicity of the Hamiltonian, yeah. So first, how to find the inverse transformation? Well, uh, the easiest way to see how it looks like is to, m to notice that the similar uh, relation holds for if I choose, let's say, up is uh, cosinus hyperbolic of some, uh, uh, let's say, phase or rapidity or whatever you call it, and vp is just sinus hyperbolic of the same phi p. Huh? So then, known uh, uh, identities for hyper hyperbolic uh, function tells you that this is fulfilled, so actually we solve it in terms of phi. We need to find phi in the end. Yeah, but this form tells you that this transformation is just a hyperbolic rotation. Yeah? But knowing this, we know how the inverse yeah, looks like. It's just this rotation with the angle minus phi. Yeah? So then, therefore, immediately I can write down that AP is UP, it doesn't change sign because cos has a uh, 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 symmetric function. And then comes alpha p, uh, but then um, uh, okay, something wrong. Wait a second. Wait a second. No, that's okay. Uh, and then, but then, then uh, v change the sign. Yeah, so the right minus v p, and then alpha minus p dagger. And the AP dagger is simply a Hermitian conjugate in UP alpha P dagger minus VP alpha minus P. So that's our inverse transformation. You can check. Yeah, if you put this form of A and A dagger into these formulas and use this condition, you will get that alpha equals alpha. Or vice versa, you can put in this formula alphas in this form and check that A equals A under this condition. Yeah, so it's really inverse transformation. So now we have a very nice exercise to put this A and A dagger into this form, well, and do something, yeah, and see, collect all these terms. So let me, uh, let me try to do it. Yeah? So H prime is, let me keep this uh, one half, G N squared over V, this is my constant term, so now plus. And now we have this very pleasant sum. 
Uh, let me call these things, just to make a notation short, epsilon p tilde. Yeah, so it is epsilon p plus gn, yeah, <coughs> just shorter. So let me first write you down all the terms with epsilon p tilde. I the rest maybe I just copy from my notes. Huh? So you see a dagger a, so we have a dagger a, so we have terms like u p squared, and then we have uh, alpha p squared alpha p, yeah, when it's this with this. Let me directly copy also, make a product of these things. Then I have plus v p squared, and now I have alpha minus p, alpha minus p dagger. It has also alpha alpha dagger, but minus p, which is not a problem because p is summation index, we can immediately change it to minus p, but it has the wrong order. No? That would be actually important for finding the E0. No? That is a, a good part, and now comes the, uh, the part where you have alpha alpha and, and uh, alpha dagger alpha dagger, so it would be, my in both cases I will have, it's a cross product, both I will have minus u p v p, and then I will have um, alpha p, sorry, alpha minus p, alpha p, plus alpha p dagger alpha minus p dagger. So this is the first term. We can also do similar, the second one, g n, so then I have um, twice this with minus, yeah? And let me try to do and then c controlling myself with my notes, yeah? First, let me write down indeed the terms like this, yeah? Which comes from uh, the cross product of these things, yeah? And that's one would be u p and minus v p, so I will have minus u p v p. Yeah, and then I will have, um, uh, in one case, it would be alpha p dagger uh, alpha p, yes. And the second would be simply uh, alpha minus p, alpha minus p dagger. <coughs> it's all <laughs> the cross, but now I have a dagger, two a dagger, so terms like this. Huh? And but then comes the terms again, alpha dagger, alpha dagger, and alpha alpha, and they now have a look has the same f the form like this. If I have alpha dagger, alpha dagger, that's both u, yeah. So u p squared, because it does not depend on the direction, yeah. And then I will have um, the first comes p, yeah. So I will have alpha p dagger alpha p, but then I have alpha alpha, and that would be from here. So I will get plus v p squared, and then I will have um, alpha minus p, alpha p. Sorry, I... I Yes, yes, let me write, let me write here, because as I said, u and v depends only on the modulus, so this doesn't change, but now I have alpha minus p, because minus p, yeah, M minus v p, alpha, but now p, so I change everywhere, so that's why I have, oh yeah, sorry, that's, that's, I guess, my fault. Yeah, sorry. Sorry, yeah, thank you. Yeah, and now we have the last one, yeah, this one. But this we can, of course, write immediately because it's a Hermitian conjugate term, yeah. So the first part would be the same because it's a her Hermitian with p to minus p. Yeah, but we don't care very much, so we can even write it in a, yeah, so we will have alpha minus Okay, so here uh, again, alpha p dagger alpha p, 
it's a Hermitian conjugate of this term, and here it's the same alpha minus p, alpha minus p dagger, that's Hermitian conjugate. But here we had similar terms, but now u and v replaced. Yeah? So here we'll have vp squared, it's from here, alpha minus p alpha p plus up squared um, dagger, so here in up squared with um, alpha minus p alpha p. So now you have to combine the similar terms, yeah, uh, but you also have to, so to say, transform these things in, in, a, in a more convenient way, yeah, such the dagger stays first, yeah, and, and so that means that you have to use alpha minus p, alpha minus p dagger, this directly comes from a commutation relation, that it is um, one plus alpha minus p dagger alpha minus p, yeah, because this minus this, it's a commutator and is one, yeah, so therefore from the from this commutator for minus p that just follows. Yeah? So therefore I'm using this in here, in here and in here. Yeah? And then in some places p to minus p clear in some places. Yeah, obvious uh, in, in this sense. Yeah? So now uh, see what happens. Now Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes. No, it's I hope now it's correct. Okay, so now uh, let's first collect, we, s we start with a constant, so let's correct collect this, this ones, yeah? which we end up to the energy of the ground state. Sorry, I, th I think I forgot to tell you that this would have the meaning of the energy of the ground state. For the ideal Bose gas, it is zero, yeah, because all particles sit with momenta zero, which has energy zero. But now without excitations, when this term is absent, in the ground state, the energy is E0. Uh, so, of course, the first contribution, it is very well known for you, mean field kind of contribution. Then plus, now we have a contribution from here, sum of a non-zero P, what we will have? Um, we will have uh, VP squared epsilon P tilde minus GN up vp yeah because we have uh, minus here so it's minus and we have two identical terms and to be completely sure let me just check yes this would be our e0 yeah it's a constant so now let me now take the the interesting part with operators and now I have collect terms this alpha p dagger alpha p first. Let me write the operator first, otherwise I will forget it. P and, and what comes would be um, from this one we will have epsilon p tilde and then u p squared unfortunately plus v p squared, not minus. With minus would be just one, but we have some of them. Right. And um we have from here, so each of them double here, so we'll have minus 2 gn up vp. Let's check again. Mm -hmm. So these are the good terms. So now come the bad ones. And uh, let's take this one. Uh, we have alpha p, alpha p dagger, alpha minus p dagger. And now we have here m minus epsilon p tilde 
up vp and from here we have a plus again we have two terms uh, plus one half gn up squared plus vp squared again check mm -hmm. and the last one so you will check it's the same because sort of must be Hermitian the Hamiltonian must be Hermitian so this coefficient must be the same mm. uh, but you can check it's, it's a check just that we did make some strange mistake yeah. so now you see indeed as I, I generate the terms which I don't want but I still have a freedom in choosing u's and v's so what I do I in addition to the condition where what I now should erase probably <coughs> now I'm erase too much so indeed we have this form let me let me now So if we impose another constraint, additional constraint, such that in addition to A, we impose that these brackets are zero. Yeah, so constraint B, condition B, that minus um, epsilon P up vp plus one half gn up squared plus vp squared uh, has to be zero and indeed we see you see you can satisfy yeah because this is just a single equation for a single variable yeah or you have two equations for two variables for each p yeah, so you can solve it. Of course, you will have several solutions, huh? because this is for squares, etc. But of course, you better choose the one that for g goes to zero, goes to solutions where u is one and v is zero. Yeah. If you don't have interaction, your quasi-particles are just particles. So therefore, u should be one and v should be zero alpha p is a p and uh, alpha p dagger is a p dagger for g equals zero because yeah? otherwise we must have some sort of continuum in this transformation so i give you now the solution i wouldn't go deeply so in principle you always have two equations two variables you have to manipulate in some convenient form to find the solutions and the solutions look like this let me introduce the quantity well okay EP would be then square root of epsilon P tilde squared. Sorry, this is tilde. I forgot. Yeah, because they're tilde. Minus GN squared. And uh, UPs and VPs has this form. UP squared is just one half epsilon p tilde divided by ep plus one and vp squared is one half epsilon p tilde over ep minus one you can check so if you plug in this up and vp in there keeping in mind that epsilon p is this one you find the solution yeah just to make your life a bit simpler and using this formula that we will need before, let me simply write a find for you somewhere here because I have to erase it anyway. Let me find for you very easily UP, VP, VP but let easier to find squares. Yeah? Because to find the square, then we can take a square root. 
it's we just multiply the two. Yeah. So what you get, you get one fourth, and then you will have uh, epsilon p tilde plus e p divided by e p, epsilon p tilde minus e p divided by e p. Oh, clear, yeah. That's what I just combined the two to the same fraction. Yeah. So this plus one gives me epsilon p, but yeah, clear. Yeah. But then, of course, we know that a plus b times a minus b is just a squared minus b squared. So you get one fourth e p squared epsilon p tilde squared minus e p squared. And now I'm using my definition of e p. Yeah, and then you see that I have minus e p tilde squared minus g n squared. So e p tilde cancel minus minus gives me plus. So I get g n squared divided by e p squared. And from here you immediately conclude that u p v p is just one half g n divided by e p. Very simple formula. And tha then you can plug in and then check that indeed both can. This is clear satisfied. Yeah? This requires some algebra, but most of this algebra I did for you. Yeah. So you can very easily check that these are the solutions. So typically checking the solution is always easier than to finding the solution. Yeah? But OK. So just please remember. Uh, and then EP has really the meaning of the quasi-particle excitation energies. So let's have a look closely at this quasi-particle energy dispersion relation. Yeah. So this EP is epsilon. Now I r tilde is what it is, EP plus GN. That was my EP tilde. I'm just coming back to the initial definition. But now we have a squared minus b squared. We know what it is, a minus b times a plus b. So what you get when you have a minus b, you get epsilon p. And when you have plus, you have epsilon p plus 2gn. And now epsilon p is p squared over 2m. So let me plug it in. What we get, square root of p squared over 2m, p squared over 2m uh, plus to gn and let me reorganize it uh, p you see i can take out p what is left is square root yeah let me first write this one gn over m two and a half cancels plus p squared over four m squared And now you see the miracle happens. Huh? This formula you already you have seen in the lectures of theory. Yeah? Because this dispersion at small p goes linearly because you can forget p squared. Huh? So let me plot it here. If I now have this EP and now have P, so at small p, this one dominates and you have a linear dispersion. So CP with C, A or U maybe, U, not mix this is velocity of light. GN over M. And at large P, yeah, this is clearly dominates, yeah, because this is constant. This will start dominating. So what you get is uh, p squared over 2m. That's our p particle spectrum, yeah? Well, you can do a bit better. You can say plus gm. This is your mean field shift. It comes from here. And then something which really decays when p goes to infinity. Yeah? So normally people don't write this, but p p larger, much larger than something, and p much smaller than something. Let me call it p star, and this is p star. And p star is some typical momenta. It's where these terms are roughly the same. Yeah. So this p 
phi star, you can estimate uh, when these terms becomes the same, uh, P star is roughly square root of uh, M G N. <coughs> you can define it like this. But <coughs> so up to here, you have a linear, and then around P star, you go to quadratic dispersion. So here, P squared over 2M and slightly shifted G N, if you like this term, if you don't, just skip it, P squared, the dominant one. And here we have P times U. This is, of course, sound. Yeah. Looks like sound waves. Uh, <coughs> and we check it afterwards that, indeed, if you calculate uh, thermodynamical sound velocity, that will be exactly this value. So these are actually phonons, so quanta of sound waves. So these you have phonons. And this you have free particles. So exactly what happened in one decays in the lectures of Thierry. Yeah. So no. uh, let me see. What else? What else? Yeah. So Yes, but how would you how do you how would you mean the moving of particles? It's all moving of particles, yeah. If you like, yeah. So the particles are identical, so you cannot move particle on a, if you move. So, is actually if you look uh, uh, read this actually interesting chapter in the Feynman statistical mechanics where he discussed the excitations in in sort of bosonic system, and he has some argument that it's only uh, density waves. So. Um, so now we, but we can also, so now we, in principle, we diagonalize the Hamiltonian. We know everything. We know dispersion of excitations. We know uh, how our initial atoms operate related to the excitation. So we can calculate any correlator of atoms we would like to know. And I will calculate a bit later the distribution of particles, atoms, yeah? not quasi particles, atoms in the ground state. Yeah? This part of which was kicked out of the condensate <coughs> yeah, by the interaction. So, and, and we also know the ground state energy. Yeah? So let me write you down, um, the, if you know ground state energy, we can calculate chemical potential, for example, or we can use it to calculate some thermodynamical properties, et cetera, et cetera. Let me write it here, E zero. We have this one half G N squared over V plus sum over p non zero and then we have I, I, yeah, I erased it of course yeah okay but I have it somewhere here yeah. uh, let's write this here uh, sum over p non zero and epsilon tilde p v p squared minus g n u p v p so if you do, uh, uh, remember I have here some expression there for up and vp is half gn divided by p. If you plug in here, you can rewrite the sum in a slightly different ways. There are many ways of writing the sums. Yeah, and um, uh, one of the form, oh no, no, that's fine. Uh, one of the form is actually minus one half if you do these things minus one half sum over p non zero uh, and then you have ep minus epsilon p tilde looks somewhat more interesting or you can do the even more algebra and write it in the following form minus one half sum over p non zero gn squared divided by ep plus epsilon p tilde. So these are kind of the whole set of formulas. Yeah? And of course, you can calculate these things. Yeah? And people did it. Yeah? This is kind of integrals. Uh, the subplot here will tell after I write the answer. Yeah? So you can calculate the zero. And it has the following form, uh, 2 pi 
h bar squared a s over m n squared over v and then comes the number 1 plus 128 divided by 15 square root of n a cube s cube divided by pi what is different in these expressions is I replace my g with a s yeah yeah so here in a sense I, I, I can see the g and now explain why I put a question mark as 4 pi h bar squared over m a s yeah. but it make a lot of sense having here g and g squared and here a a s yeah. first of all you see you have to do some analytical work to calculate this strange number 128 over 15 they don't come for free normally yeah. so you have to do some work yeah but most important things if you look at this expression you immediately see that it diverges at large momentum so naively you cannot calculate because at large momentum both we know both ep and epsilon p tilde behaves like p squared and if we will have and if we will have a summation so you will face with the integral of the type dp over 2 pi h bar cube and if you calculate very carefully the coefficient here uh, you will get this of course gn squared but then you will have m over p squared divergence would be of that type g squared sorry g squared n squared divergent would be of that type so if you remember here must be v so the total coefficient here would be uh, n squared over v and that would be half also times g squared and if you do things carefully there would be also one half so how we should understand this that's exactly what I said if you write g in the form of the 4 pi in this form this is just for the first order <coughs> not more than that so here we have term g squared we go beyond the first order so in doing these calculations to make sense out of these divergences yeah, you have to do what is called renormalization you have to go back to your because divergence come from a large moment a large moment means short distances Short distances means the two particles are too close to each other and they don't care about the rest of the world. It's just a two particle problem that handle handles this divergency. And two particle problem in quantum mechanics is just a scattering theory. So you have to go back to York's lectures. Fortunately he didn't give you. The more efficient way to treat it is to what is called Lippmann Schwinger equation, so it's some integral equation for the scattering amplitude and there you can expand uh, in, in a power series and you will see if you model your potential as a point like delta function of r times g in the second order you get exactly the same divergence exactly the same divergence but you know the answer in the in the um, scattering theory in the end the divergence comes of course because at large momenta this particle starts feeding the internal structure of E. It's not anymore a quantum construction. Atomic potentials are always has internal structure. The size will cut your momentum integral. So in the end, you will have some cut of lambda that comes from the internal structure of the potential. So in fact, th there is never divergent integrals here. But in the model that you use in here, and if you use the same in the scattering theory, you get exactly the same divergence. But in scattering theory, you know what to do you know that this in the end will give you the scattering amplitude or scattering length so therefore the idea is to absorb these divergences second order with the first order term you see it has exactly the same structure one half n squared over v now you have g plus g squared and divergent integral it's exactly what you get in a second order naive approximation lipman schwinger equation for the scattering amplitude yeah? so the idea is how to treat these things is to subtract from here this divergency yeah, 
then combine it with this term, g squared plus g squared, this integral, and call everything scattering amplitude. That's how it works. In the second order, what is left, you don't need to do it because it's already second order. Yeah? And that's why here, what is left, if I, if I have the formula, probably I, I don't. No, I, I don't think I have it with me. I'm sorry, but those who are interested, those who are interested, I can show how it works. Yeah, uh, because I have all the formulas, all the integrals. So, but not now, yeah, because it will take a lot of time. Yeah. So therefore, what you get, the first order with this one, it's exactly this term and divergent part of this one. Because divergence, if you do it like this, it doesn't know about the the densities, etc. It's really free particle. Two particle colliding. Yeah. And this is this AS here and the rest, the rest. You see, it looks like G squared contribution. But the rest, which knows about many body, so the finite momenta, not very large momenta, but finite momenta of the order of P star, they know about many body. And that's why you don't get here AS squared you get very strange and analytical form. You have square a s to the power three half. So in the end, you get there g to the power three half, non a, a perturbative result. Yeah. So therefore, it looks like g squared, but if you take a many body stuff part of it, it's <laughs> not g squared. It's g to the power three half. Huh? So this is contribution from this quantum fluctuation. Sometimes people say yeah. So, so please be careful. This is one of the examples where you have to remember your potential is not point-like. Hmm? And, and this is because we take, consider in the Hamiltonian, we can see the processes where two particles going from the condensate go to P minus P, or particles with P minus P go back to the condensate. But P is not limited, can be very, very high. But then we know, we have to know that a potential actually has a structure. It's not constant everywhere. We are not in the field theory. Yeah? We are in atomic physics where you have some sizes, etc., etc. So it has to be cutted or more precisely renormalized in a way that you express everything at low energy in terms of a scattering e length. This is possible. So, yeah. Okay. Um, quick question. If, uh, only quick. Ah, yes, because in a small momenta, at small momenta, you have here GN. No, no. It's P squared. P squared dP is a measure. It's a linear divergence. So, um, So the next things I want to discuss, ah uh, yes, of course, and now we can calculate the chemical potential. Yeah? Remember, in at, at ideal Bose gas, it was zero below Tc. And uh, yeah, so, and for, for uh, uh, but above it should be always negative. For ideal Bose system, chemical potential should always be negative. But in this case, we are not, we don't have in this problem. Where is my chemical potential? Yes. It is, of course, started with Gn. That's exactly the first term. Yeah. If I differentiate with n, I get 2n. 2 cancels half, and I have Gn over v at Gn. But now comes this addition. 1 plus, well, this is a simple differentiation, although you have to sort of recognize how the, the, the particles number comes, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So this is the result, and you see it's positive. No, so and that's that's fine. In ideal Bose gas, it has to be negative because the lowest energy in your system has to be above the lowest energy of the of the bath. Because otherwise, if it's below, particle will infinitely flow into the system because there is no mechanism in the system that stabilizes the density. In the repulsive Bose gas, it's repulsive interaction that in the end stabilizes your density. So that's why chemical potential is, is always positive. Huh? 
Now having this E, we can also I can also show you that these excitations that we have are nothing but the sound waves, at, at least at small p. Yeah? For this, we have to go back to thermodynamic. Yeah, and uh, 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 what is this? We know that the sound uh, uh, velocity is just the derivative of the pressure with respect to density, or it is mass density, or it's 1 over m dp dn. But p, in turn, is <coughs> minus uh, d e 0 dv. And if you limit yourself just on this simple, the first term, first order term, this one, you can very easily perform all the calculations. So this would be, I guess, minus, uh, so minus in dvv denominator. So we have one half g, and then we have extra v in denominator, so n squared. Huh? If I skip these high order terms. And therefore, my if I put it in here, yeah, I will get g n over m. Uh, that's exactly what we have. So it's this slope is nothing but the sound velocity. Uh, so the the yeah, or the sound waves. So this is kind of uh, normal sound waves. A bit more careful if in the Bogolubov, in the, in the Gross-Pitayevsky description, this corresponds to the phase fluctuation of your field. Yeah, you introduce your field, modulus is fixed by the square root of density, yeah, like what Thierry uh, uh, wrote. But the phase, phase we can fix because we have spontaneous symmetry breaking with a fixed phase. Yeah, but uh, if you consider the solution to a slow fluctuating phase, that would correspond to the modulus to these sound waves. Last things about this formula, we see what is the small parameter yeah, of the theory. The small parameter is here appears as NAS cube. And what it is, remember, so it is exactly conditions where AS, now AS plays the size of the interparticle, or the range of the potential, is much smaller then the separation of particles. This is, remember, that was our guess condition in the a, in a very, very beginning. So this is exactly, if you do some simple algebra, means this one. In the guess, if we are in the guess, indeed, these things are small. Now, and these are just correction, although, although non-perturbative. You cannot get this just applying the perturbation theory. So let me now spend some time. Ah, yeah, and of course, having this dispersion, we know that the critical velocity would be just u. So, so if we now take a flow with velocity below this u, it will continue forever without dissipation. This is, of course, cheating because it's not the only excitations in the system. Yeah? We have to take these vortices, wrinkle vortices, and they most of all limits you this in a kind of exotic channels because we know if the liquid flows in some natural channels, there would be some um, turbulence effects, which appears here as a vortex and vortex ring creation, and those are actually limiting, in most of the experiment, uh, the critical velocity, not the phonons. Yeah. In, a, in a kind of more clear case, it's a phonons otherwise. No. And uh, if you do the other experiment, where you liquid at rest, but your tube is moving, yeah, then you will have a kind of Cherenkov effect. Yeah? If the velocity of your tube, you know what is Cherenkov effect. Yeah? So if the velocity of the tube is below u, nothing is emitted. But if it's above u, you can kind of Cherenkov effects starts emitting photons, phonons. Yeah? So that means if your tube will be 
faster than liquid, it will eventually take the liquid with you, and then in the end, yeah, no more excitations will be created. Okay, so now we have superfluidity. I can also calculate the correlation function, but let me maybe do uh, uh, some intermediate step, which is actually interesting in itself. Let me calculate the momentum distribution. Uh, MP of atoms. Um, let me do it Okay, in the ground state for t equals zero. <coughs> uh, I have to plug in my expressions for A in terms of alpha because for alpha I know everything. No? So that would be UP alpha P dagger minus VP alpha minus P. That my AP dagger, and now I have UP alpha P minus VP alpha minus P dagger in a ground state. Because I have a ground state, yeah, alpha P ground state is always zero, and similar ground state alpha P dagger is also zero. Yeah? So if you create here particle, it cannot be ground state anymore. <coughs> And here there is no excitations, you're killing, trying to kill, you get zero. Yeah? So therefore the only terms that survives is this and this. Yeah? So you get GS, U, uh, actually VP, VP and minus. So what you get VP squared and then ground state uh, alpha minus P, alpha minus P dagger, GS. But the trick again, as we did in the derivation, write it as one plus alpha minus p dagger alpha minus p. And again, this is a number of excitation, which is zero in the ground state. So it's only one that matters. And of course, ground state normalized to one. So what you get is vp squared. If you do at zero, at non-zero temperature, let me now think. You will get a part which is um, uh, at zero temperature. Uh, this is what zero temperature, ground state. If you do it at finer temperature, of course, you have a, a thermal ensemble uh, where you have some thermally excited excitation. So you get the terms like uh, UP U squared, you can check it, plus VP squared. In this case, of course, alpha dagger alpha would be not zero, no? and then you have uh, NP, let me call it index alpha, I think I'm, I'm correctly, no? okay, we can check it after, so where NP alpha is just for the statistical average alpha p dagger alpha p and this is of course given by because they are bosons and this free boson this Hamiltonian in the end is a free boson Hamiltonian for these quasi particles and this is just 1 over e to the ep over t minus 1 that what you get for the uh, atoms of course p non zero yeah, because P0, it's uh, N0. Uh, we still have to find. Uh, it's still kind of <laughs> mysterious quantity. But we know that at zero temperature, our NP is just VP squared. And now I am, I am so to say, uh, I am uh, give you the answer for this. Yeah, with all what you have, it's very easy to find. And we analyze the answers here. So now we find out that the atoms in the ground state, t equals zero, distributed according to 
gp squared that's exactly the part that was kicked out by the interaction from the contents yeah and remember that was one half epsilon p tilde ep minus one yeah and now i have to do some little algebra to write it in a more convenient form so now i multiply and divide by ep tilde plus ep such that i will have uh, epsilon p tilde squared minus ep squared divided by ep and ep plus epsilon p squared tilde sorry and this i know if i use the definition of ep squared then i get one half gn squared divided by ep ep plus epsilon p tilde that's the answer no? and how it looks like uh, first of all it's g yeah yeah so in, in fact g3 half because for small p we also have some g in our sound velocity yeah? but anyway when g is zero all zero yeah as we know ideal boson gas g zero no particles with p non-zero appears yeah? so in our case they appear and then if i look how it behaves then for small p this is this proportional to p p times u yeah? this is p times u this is gn plus p squared yeah? so the dominant one would be here gn from this one this you can neglect for small p yeah? gn cancels one of the gn so it should s behaves like gn divided by p times square root of gn over m that is from the velocity for p much less than p star yeah so on this part of the dispersion you see you have one over p rather singular behavior one over p and it's again not a surprise we know it's already uh so uh, yeah they are macroscopically occupied these states with small p they are not macroscopically largely occupied and that's why we can have a very nice mean field descriptions for large p on the opposite this is constant we can neglect and both of them behaves like three particle case so what you get is one half gn squared and here you will have p squared over to m squared so this scales like one over p here but this scales one of the p to the fourth at p much larger than p star and this is a nice result tells you that you have a overall number of particles with non-zero p is finite because the integral with one of the p to the fourth at large p converges yeah so if i plot the distribution n p of course here i have a delta function yeah n zero we will find in a minute delta p yeah this is zero then we have this p star and p so here i will have roughly uh, one over p behavior which comes very fast to the one of p to the fourth and this is this is clearly g squared because these of course you can take consider okay it's a perturbative result because the energy is so high so you don't have any kind of problems here so this is np particles if you plot me what's the distribution of np alpha it's this one no um excitations but the particles distributed like this yeah and now knowing this we can calculate depletion condensate depletion i guess it should call be m or something like this n prime yeah. okay let me call it n prime which is sum over p this n p
So that means you have to perform the integral, volume integral dp over 2 pi h bar cube of our vp squared. Yeah, because vp, it's all this. You can choose whatever expression you like. This is probably the most convenient. And the answer for this is the answer. So if you do the integrals, it's actually also not so. For those who are interested, I, I, can, I can give you the answer, so show the details. So it is, of course, n times 8 over 3, and again, this small parameter, n a cube over pi. So it is much less than n. So on total, it's this fraction of total number of particles are kicked out of the condensate by the interaction. Yeah? And it's finite. So that's nice. That means that the n0, which is n minus n prime, is given by n 1 minus 8 over 3 square root of n a s cube over pi is of the order of n. So it remains macroscopic. You do have macroscopic of your ground, of the p equals zero state. So this is bc, so we have bc in three dimensions because this is fine. In lower dimensions, if you do things like this, you will find divisions. Yeah, so the fluctuations will destroy you. The condensate, so you cannot have it. But in 3D, it's fine. You have a condensate, you have this dispersion, which mil miraculously valid also in one dimension, where there is no condensate, but because it's just waves. Yeah, waves kind of linear, okay. Yeah, so uh, one comment. This is, all these particles belongs to the ground state wave function. These are not excitations. So if you ask me whether these particles contribute to superfluid flow, the answer is yes. Because very often people defined also, uh, it's, it's a condensate, but you can also define superfluid velocity and, and normal velocity. Because it t is non zero. So at t equals zero, all particles are in the superfluid. The superfluid density is exactly the total density of the gas. It has nothing to do with temperature. It's a part of the, the same wave function. They all, both these ones and these ones, contribute in this collective motion. Yeah. In helium-4, for example, at T0, ah yeah, and if you start heating the system at finer temperature, you get a gas of excitations, which behaves like a particles, and in the end form the gas of these excitations. They look like a normal gas, what is called normal component of the gas. This is a gas of excitations. Yeah. So therefore, it's a very nice description at these low temperatures as a collection two fluid description. One is purely superfluid, described by unique wave function, which contains both zero momentum and non-zero momentum, has zero entropy because it's a wave function, it's a pure state, zero entropy, and a normal component, which is gas, gas of thermal excitation. This is kind of description was very successfully developed by Gus Halatnikov, and, and it was uh, tested many, many times, and it has a very nice description for the systems. Yeah? But if you look at the helium, you can check what is the kind of fraction, rho n to rho s, uh, s is superfluid, n is normal, and you see that at zero temperature, rho s goes to one, uh, to n, and rho n, normal compound, goes to zero. So it's very low temperatures, it's only superfluid component, but if you do um, neutron diffraction, you can calculate the fraction that sits in here, P0, uh, because you know how the atoms distributed, you can measure. It's, I guess, 12%. So in helium-4, where this is of the order 1, you cannot treat it perturbatively. That's why spectrum is not that simple. You have also roton minima, etc. so the spectrum is not that simple. Only 12% sits here, but the entire system 
is superfluid and covered by the unique wave function, macroscopic wave function, both this particle and this one. So please, don't be confused about this. Huh? Okay, I think I should stop here. Yeah. Yes, probably correlation function. Yeah, okay, let's skip it because... Ah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the probably the last formula which I want to write you, it's not the correlation function, where clearly you will have long-range order, again, determined by the density number of particles in here. The rest gives you 1 over r squared sort of decay. It's not 1 over r like we had before, because we have 1 over r came from this Fourier of 1 over p squared. But here we will have p. And Fourier of 1 over p is... It's inverse, yeah? You have a Coulomb, so in the real space it's 1 over r, in a momentum 1 over k squared, and inverse, yeah? If you have 1 over k, 1 over r, and so it would be 1 over r squared for this reason, yeah? It's a kind of inverse. So it's a bit faster, but still you have long-range order given by the number of particles here. So, so the, the, the last formula maybe to this um, bosonic part I want to present you is how these magic ground state, remember our definition of the ground state, huh? looks like in terms of the atom. <coughs> so the ground state is, so you have to make a product of all pairs of p and minus p, so that means you'd, 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 you should be careful not to count twice all this momentum. And then it's like this, 1 over up, and then e to the minus vp over up, and then a minus p dagger a p dagger acting on our vacuum state. So the, the meaning of this <coughs> would be actually very much similar to the BCS wave function for fermions. Yeah? So meaning of this, you see, you populate states with some amplitude, yeah, because if you expand the exponent, you will have this all possible pair. You populate this, this p minus p yeah, states, always p minus p for different p many times, or one time, or three times, yeah, but it's always p minus p. And that's exactly how this our I initial Hamiltonian looks like, yeah? You see? It's always come to the condensate and go back in pairs p minus p. So what is above condensate is this created by this p minus p. So this is the operator form of these things, of course, it doesn't have a fixed number of particles, yeah? Yeah, because you see different terms. The leading term, where all exponent gives you one, has no particles at all. Yeah? But of course, if we, but, but it's a standard story. Yeah? Yeah. So uh, if you calculate, so to say, n, you will see a very high peak around our n, which we fix, uh, with one over square root of n fluctuations around. So it's 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 standard story. In the BCS would be exactly the same story. Yeah. So and because we are dealing with many particles, somehow this one over square root of fluctuation are irrelevant. So you actually all the time uh, or you can make a projection on a particular sector with a fixed number of particles. That's also possible. Whatever you like. If you like with projections, work with projections. But otherwise it also works. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, questions to this part. Bosonic part, because now I switch to fermions. So this would be the formula. Uh, if you lo just look at the population, you won't see any, uh, you, you cannot distinguish. You will get total NP, you see, you will get a sum. NP would be a sum, which is a kind of a condensate part, or this superfluid wave function part, yeah. Yeah, and some thermal excitation. On this graph, you couldn't see. Okay. You couldn't so see. No, no, they kind of d d diminish yeah. this. They took particles from a superfluid component, and the density of superfluid component becomes less, 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 and less. But you pointed out that 
So if you now, sorry, if you now create this flow, yeah, so in the end, it's not all N will flow, but only superfluid N will flow. No, red curve is a, no, f at, at this is a T equals zero. Yeah, yeah, but like a yeah, yeah, we'll have a Boltzmann distribution actually. Yeah. With one of a, with dispersion proportion to P, so it will be quite uh, singular at small P. But of course, the, the phase volume would be very small, so it's no problem, yeah. But that would always be like y equals zero or something like that. No, no, this is total. I can, I can try to write down, although <laughs> now I'm a bit, NP superfluid and NP normal gas. Meaning that this part, which is temperature dependent, form the normal gas. So I will then I will need to have a two curve. No, no, red is for quasi particles. White for particles. They anyway would will be different because you see at t z at t zero they are different. This is no quasi particles, but the particles are distributed. Then at finite t, this will get some behavior like this, yeah. And this, in principle, would also be modified, but I can split it now in the physics behind. I can split it in the sum of two curves. One belongs to this part, and roughly is a part that is in a superfluid component in the single macroscopic wave function, as a part that is uh, taken by the thermal excitation. No, just you have to plot these two curves. There, the white is this one, but of course, when you go to fire temperature, the amplitude will go down. Yeah, yeah. but then this part appears. Yeah. So now let's go to fermions, because otherwise tomorrow we will miss the, the dinner, which we definitely, uh, today, sorry, not tomorrow, today. <laughs> today you can miss the dinner, but for a different reason. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Yeah, it's a message, that's a message. It's only interaction makes the system behaves collectively. Yeah. That's a good question. I, at some point, if the interaction would be too strong, you would form a crystal, I guess. Well, it depends on the form of interaction. Yeah? But we know that the ground state of all our atoms, which we study these gases, potassium, lithium, the ground state is a crystal. Mm -hmm. So somehow I would think that if you have too strong interaction, yeah. But too strong interaction, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a di it's an interesting story what will happen. Because it's not that you, uh, AS, it makes no sense to put AS to infinity. Yeah? As Jok explained you that you're in a unitary limit. So the amplitude is actually, well, you have 1 over k squared. In the bosons, it probably matters. But um, <laughs> yeah. So to be honest, you have to do numerics. Uh, you have to look at the bosons, you can do numerics. I think it will be crystal. But I'm not 100% sure. Okay. Let's go to fermions. Now let's start with, okay, fermions. And now we have non, <coughs> instead of commutators. And again, let's start because I will uh, look at the ideal, so free fermions. So at the moment, today, no interaction, maybe beginning of tomorrow, would be no interaction. And I take a single component Fermionic gas, yeah. So for this reason, I can ignore spins, etc. So it's just a position, so single component. The rest, if any quantum numbers you have, they are just all the same. And of course, for this case, your operators has to anti-commute. And Let me write for daggers.
and A is the same. So from here, of course, immediately you, you know this, this very famous Pauli principle. So not more than one fermion in a given quantum state. So I can see this box, yeah? three fermions in a box. Yeah. Again, you can replace P with any other index, whatever meaning it has, harmonic trap, atom or whatever. Well, atoms, electrons are not entirely free, uh, non-interacting, but yeah. So uh, no, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so, and, and of course, if we now have n fermions on total, n fermions in a box, we know what's a ground state. Yeah, so it's just repeat what we know. So ground state, how it looks like, let me write the momentum space Px, Py in the case of two dimensions. The ground state is just a field Fermi sphere. So ground state field Fermi sphere. So meaning that there is some boundary Pf, which is Fermi momentum, that the all state inside are occupation one yeah, and all state outside and occupation zero. This is a ground state. Uh, <coughs> the energy at this momentum, which is a kind of border energy, it's of course Pf squared over 2m, this is a Fermi energy. Or you can also define the velocity, Pf over m, which is again Fermi velocity. And the surface itself called Fermi surface. Yeah, this is Fermi surface. So everything Fermi. So Fermi, and then you choose your option. Yeah. So, well, he deserves it, yeah? no doubt. OK, uh, so uh, the first question, of course, what is this PF? How can we define PF? And this is just a bookkeeping of the states. Yeah? Because box, we know this kind of quantization rule in a box. So in a sense, the, the rules are if we calculate total number of states inside the box, it must be n, because each state occupied once. So we have to simply count the number of states. And this, uh, uh, you can write np, yeah? and, uh, but np, uh, it you can have many forms. Of course, we know np, it is a uh, convenient form for t equals 0 a ground state, it's epsilon f minus epsilon p. Yeah, where again epsilon p is before p squared over 2m. So it's a heavy side step function, it's a convenient <laughs> form. Yeah. So integration here up to p equals pf, so it is volume times 4 pi solid angle, 2 pi h bar cube, and then integral 0 pf p squared dp. And so what we get is volume times uh, 1 over integral is p cube over 3. And with all these 4, 2 to the etc. So we get 6 pi squared h bar cube pf <coughs> cube. And you come to a very interesting result that the pf depends only on the particle's density. No mass, nothing just a particle dense, because it's just simple counting on the state in the box. Yeah, just boundary condition and the length, that's what matters. Yeah? Energy depends on the mass, but counting on state does not. So that means that you get a, a, a formula, which is n, the concentration, n over v, which is a concentration of fermions, 
is pf cube divided by 6 pi squared h bar cube or we immediately find that pf is uh, square root oh sorry not square root 6 pi h bar uh, cube n one third. So you know the concentration, you know the PF, you know the epsilon F. In a harmonic confinement, it would be slightly different, but the PF make no sense. You have F, E, epsilon F makes sense, but PF, what's the PF? Yeah? You know, make not much sense. Yeah? <coughs> you can next, what you can calculate, let's calculate the energy of the ground state. Yeah. For ideal Bose, I guess that was zero, yeah? because all seeds in zero, here we have distributed quite a lot. And this is, you see, n one third, this is interparticle distance. <coughs> so moment PF is large, yeah? because it corresponds in wavelength with interparticle separation. So it's short wavelength compared, well, for the appropriate, appropriate scales. If you calculate uh, the energy, so you have to, again, do the following things. dp over 2 pi h bar cube. Then we have np, and then we have p squared over 2m. No? Because each one wants and has the p squared over m. So let me do it quickly. Volume, again, 4 pi, 2 pi h bar cube. And then we have 1 over 2m. But now we have integral zero infinity p to the uh, fourth dp, yeah, because p squared was in the me pf 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 pf. Yes, because p squared was in the measure and p squared in the energy. So what you get this integral? Let me quickly erase it. It gives you p Fermi fifth yeah, divided by five. Yeah, and now if you compare this formula. In this formula, yeah, so let me take Pf squared divided by 2m, that would be my epsilon Fermi out. Yeah, then what I will have P Fermi cube, volume with some coefficient. This is something that is can be related to n. Yeah. And if I do things properly, the coefficient is 3 over 5 n. because integral p4 give you 1 over 5, but here we have integral p squared that gives us p 1 third. Yeah? And that's why 3 over 5 is the what is left. So what we find out, if we now calculate the energy per particle, that would be 3 5 over epsilon Fermi. It's, <laughs> it's a large energy. Yeah? Yeah. So particles in the Fermi gas moving like crazy. Yeah? This actually is a good sign for theorists because they can play with the, their famous tool perturbation theory. So that means perturbation theory works nicely. For bosons, we have here zero. And any tiny quantity is anyway much, much larger than zero. Yeah? <laughs> So here we have a finite value, <laughs> finitely big value. <laughs> yes. So here it, it works nicely, yeah, perturbation theory. And the last things I will give you, of course, you know this. I can also calculate the, the pressure, yeah, which is minus d e zero over volume. And of course, for Bose gas, we will get zero. But in this case, we will get something clearly non-zero. And let me find out. Yes, that is, that it is. It is two fifth n epsilon Fermi. Clear non-zero and actually large. And of course, you know this is this is very important thing uh, for the neutron stars, for example. Yeah, because it's exactly this pressure compensate the gravitational attraction and prevent these stars from collapse and things like this. Yeah, and maybe the last things just to prepare all necessary formulas for this afternoon to have a good chance not miss the dinner. 
I introduce a very important property, which is called a, a new F, which is density of state of the Fermi surface. This is density of states at at the Fermi at, at p equal or e or epsilon equal epsilon f or p equals p f etc etc. Yeah? Because as you know, we already talked by theory, all life at very small temperatures or, or very slow perturbation is around here. These particles are blocked by the Pauli principle. The whole life goes here. So we want to know what's the density of states in this region where the life goes on. Yeah? So my definition is nu f. Uh, it's, yeah, it is, uh, you have to count all the states. Uh, maybe I should use it in a unit volume. Yeah. Per volume. So that's why I, I skip this volume before my interval. It's dp over 2 pi h bar cube. And now I will have a uh, delta function, epsilon f minus epsilon p. And if you do the calculation here, what you do, uh, Okay, so uh, it is, uh, of course, this one you call pf squared over 2m. This one is p squared over 2m. Yeah, so in the end, 2m you can take out, and delta function pf minus p, you know how to treat, huh? so yeah, two things. So in the end, you get m pf over 2 pi squared h bar cube. It's a kind of not a surprise. Remember, in, in the, in the three-dimensional case, it's the square root of energy. And energy in our case is p squared over 2m. So this was square root of energy that you normally have if you write here energy, not ep, ep Yes, because pf is 2m epsilon f. Yeah, so, yeah. I put here pf, yeah, which is the same and maybe more convenient form, 2m epsilon f. Then you recognize this square root of energy dependence in a three-dimensional box, in a three-dimensional case. So this is a very important quantity. It contains the mass. Yeah, so, yeah, so the mass is very large, then the density of state huge, like for heavy fermions. If it's small, then okay, then it's small. Yeah. So I think now we have to stop because already 20 passed. Yeah, we started a bit late, so, but I still to be honest, I was also a bit late. Yeah. So questions? I guess this, I just remind you and put the all formulas that we will need for the, the evening. Yeah, so, yeah. So questions, if not, we'll just have some small coffee.